Hey, Craig. Hi, Jerry. How are you? I'm good. And Gil is here as well. How are you? How's, how's your world? Oh, uh, it's good, I guess. But as you said in your mail, you know, so many issues and so little time, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, I think my most difficult task these days is uh, swimming against the stream, <laughs> which, which has been true for a hundred years, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> to keep one's chin up, you know? Yeah, exactly, it's, exactly. And it's all worth fighting for, my goodness, but uh, uh, fighting despondency from time to time, I find. You know, mm. things, are, things are tough. You know, yeah, not in my that, personal life, but in the world in general, you know. Oh, well, for sure. I mean, there's a whole yeah. young people are trying to figure out whether or not to have kids. Like the, the yeah, really, the birth rate is going down. Mm. People are kind of figuring out, people are making like different decisions about whether to start a family, like because of, because of the world. That's true. That's got to be significant, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's happening. Hey, everybody. Morning, morning, morning. Um, what's the, what's, what, anybody um, want to remember something that put a smile on your face in the last couple of days? <clears throat> Other than one of us saying something strange, which happens regularly for me. Got a new tire on the, a new front tire on my motorcycle yesterday. Excellent. Um, the guys at Kawasaki had failed to balance it last time, so it wore out way, way quicker than the, the rear, so I had to buy another one. And uh -huh. when I presented the issue to them with smiles, as one does in Thailand, they fitted it real quick. They gave me uh, uh, free brake pads and didn't charge me anything. Wow. Isn't that work. nice? Yeah, that, so that was super, yeah. You'll, just, be, you'll be back, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's about maintaining good relationships where you can, even although people have let you down, perhaps. I'm sure they didn't do it deliberately. That's nice. So, See, yeah, so that, that, that put a smile yeah. on your face. There you go. <clears throat> nice, so. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I had a smile on my face this morning. I looked out the window and there was a gigantic uh, rainbow, just a huge, beautiful oh, rainbow because nice. the rains are starting. But this morning is just kind of misty and sunrise is behind us because we face east, uh, we face west. Uh, and so the, the hillside was just starting to light up and the whole hillside was framed in a gigantic, gigantic rainbow. It was really beautiful. Anybody else, anything that put a smile on your face in the last couple of days? Um, you asked me that question, puts a smile on my face, Jerry. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I think it's a great way to start a call. <laughs> I like that. Kid. Thank you. <clears throat> <laughs> um, uh, actually, I saw a couple of poems go by in the last couple of days that put a smile on my face. Um, if only I had sort of marked them out, because I don't know that I can find my way back to them. But there's one that is in, uh, in Spanish and English, and it cuts back and forth in just a very beautiful way. Um, and it's the subject of it is really good. So um, I don't remember which one it was. Um, why don't we start our, our uh, actually, no, before we start our rounds, I, I want to say that um, this Monday, uh, Jim Rutt of Game B uh, said yes to funding a small amount of money to start up uh, a video podcast uh, called Weaving the World, which I proposed to him, uh, and which, uh, and, and at the risk of mixing too many metaphors here, uh, Weaving the World feeds uh, the big fungus. Uh, and so Weaving the World will, will try to visit people who have good ideas to fix the world. Um, and I think that who we visit and how we go about it is interesting. But then, uh, but then what'll be interesting is, uh, and I, I'm kind of saying that the, the podcast lives above ground where it looks and smells like other podcasts, but below ground we're busy kind of feeding the fungus. Uh, which means we and hopefully others um, will be putting together a persistent memory of what it was that happened in the episodes, uh, who, what, where, 
uh, how that all works. And the beginnings of that will be me minding my brain and then publishing those things openly. But as we go, um, hopefully, uh, we start to sort of build the plane as we fly it and other people show up and start to connect in uh, to that. And we, and we figure out how to use it in different ways. Mr. Kaminsky. Cool. Um, congratulations, Trey, that's great news. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit, since this is an OGM call, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between Weaving the World and OGM. Uh, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, so OGM, as we kind of decided a couple months ago on a call, is less an organization and more a movement or a hashtag or a way of being in the world, or as Pete also said very early in our calls, a verb. Um, and so uh, Weaving the World is an OG, we, both of these entities are OGME entities and are basically held in the OGM community and held by OGM. So they're in that sense, they are powered by OGM, OGM projects, uh, however you might wanna say it. Uh, and I'm hoping that the OGM community uh, wants to take part and jumps in and does different sorts of things. Uh, also, Weaving the World is meant to be one of many different shows or other entities that are feeding the big fungus. So I'd like to invite others who have a sort of parallel thoughts to come in and, and do those kinds of things. Um, th those are the starting thoughts. Pete, other things in your mind about that? Um, uh, I, I wonder, so is, uh, is Weaving the World an OGM project, an OGME project? Um, yes, is, it, yes. is, it a, is it a project by who's 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 weaving the world and is it kind of like visiting the different OGME parts of of space time and and describing how they are OGME and um yes so um so I'm mentioning it here because we you know we have an entity that uh that we can pick up and start doing and uh, if other people would like to participate and Stacy and I've been talking a bunch about uh her approach toward figuring out um, yeah, games that motivate people to do things that are OGME. Uh, and I think sort of, I think where we are right now, Stacy, correct me if I'm wrong, is that in, in, some, uh, in some sense, you'll be a correspondent of OGM rather than standing up your own podcast or your own, your own entity, which sounds totally awesome to me. And um, so, so think here of John Stewart and, and, uh, or, or Trevor Noah and his correspondence, although there's no pressure to be funny, Stacy, but, but some of, I'm some actually of, very funny. You don't know me that well, but I'm very funny. You know what? If you want to go crazy on that front, I am all on board. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and then Pete is asking in the chat, oh, so weave the world in the big fungus. Really good basic questions. Um, so um, weaving, I, I, view, I view my use of the, uh, of the brain as a form of modern information loom. <clears throat> and in fact, Marc-Antoine Ferrand, uh, who is in the OGM community, uh, has a pro an older project called InfoLoom. I think that's the name of this project. Uh, and so for, for me, um, weaving information is part of weaving the world. And, um, and one, of, one of my beliefs, which is kind of a, a claim behind this, is that we're, we're losing ability to cooperate, collaborate, uh, and fix things that are, that are problematic right outside the window because we don't have a shared context. We're not, we have a Wikipedia and we have a Google and those are interesting and they're important and essential foundations, but we're, we're not sort of making sense of the world enough together. Uh, and so weaving the world is, is a, a big piece of that. Uh, and it includes the social, emotional um, yin side of all that. So uh, a piece of weaving the world could be, hey, here's a nugget of information. Let's connect it logically to all the things that it belongs to. Another piece of weaving the world is sitting down with people who have different points of view from us and figuring out how that works. So, so weaving the world as a show is meant to explore that territory and go visit people and communities uh, and build some of the connections that we're looking to do. Um, the big fungus is a, thanks Pete for putting idea loom in the chat. Um, and the big fungus is a metaphor I really like partly because it's funny, like who doesn't want a t-shirt that says I feed the big fungus um, maybe most of you don't want one, but I do. Uh, and I use it because um, I feel like I've been feeding a, a big fungus sort of uh, in a lonely way for a while while working out this brain thing. And what I mean is, uh, if, and some of you have already heard this multiple times, but leaf cutter ants don't eat leaves. They can't digest and metabolize leaves. What they do is they bring those leaves into the hive where they mulch them up 
put them on a fungus and the fungus metabolizes the leaves and feeds the entire hive. Um, and in this way, I think weaving, and, and here's where the metaphors really start getting mixed up and funny, but in this way, I think weaving the world would be multiple people coming together to um, feed the fungus uh, and whatever other communities want to call the fungus. I don't like, like the big fungus is just one way of visualizing this shared space of what we know, what we believe, and, uh, and how we're gonna to work together to, to, to solve things, right? Um, and, and it's perfectly okay for other people to have different names and descriptors for it. The goal here is for us to connect what we know and to be able to see and compare and set up experiments and tell stories, all of those kinds of things within these frameworks. Um, and for right now, the big fungus lives on GitHub and in uh, actually on YouTube. For example, one piece of our big fungus is all the calls that we've had that I've downloaded from Zoom, uploaded to YouTube, added to some playlists and all that. Those are, those are part of the big fungus uh, because they're in the public sphere. Anybody can go watch them. Uh, I, I have links to them from my brain. Other people are linking to them in other ways. Uh, so those, that's part of the big fungus. And then we've exported uh, my brain into a bag of JSON objects, but we haven't yet done anything active with that. But the moment that becomes a more active thing uh, and we draw people's attention to it, that is a piece of the big fungus. And, and I'm thinking metaphorically, again, to mix metaphors, of my brain as starter, the way you have sourdough starter to start the next batch of sourdough as starter for this, uh, this brain. Uh, so let me pause for a second and see what confusions I've, I've raised by mixing metaphors and trying to explain this. Other qu the questions are great, thank you. Would you go along with the idea of big mushroom instead of big fungus? So uh, yes, and mycelium came up also as, as, the, as the question and hyphae are the tippy, the tippy ends of mycelium. Um, I like all this language. Um, so mushroom is just the fruiting body of mycelium. So the big mushroom uh, is like interesting, but, the, but also the mushroom occurs above ground and is the visible part and the edible part of this whole thing. Actually, the mycelium is sort of edible. It depends on like where you're growing it. If you're growing it on soil, not so edible, but if you're growing it by itself, you can feed it to pigs. It's really nutritious. Anyway, um, so, and, and this is initial language. This is sort of a starting point. Um, I just I just think that the big fungus is much funnier than the big mycelium or the mycelium or the social mycelium or the knowledge mycelium or something like that. But I'm happy to riff on these things. It's 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 funnier, but I think the listening in this culture is that fungus is nasty, which is totally cool. Like if you want to engage children, talk about poop. Uh -huh, that's true. Right. Uh, you just start a poop joke and talk about poop, and they'll be like, ah, geez, but what? Okay. So I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good with getting a little grubby and having people have a little ew response uh, because also we have an ew response. We've sort of come into, I think, a, 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 a piece of society. And I attribute this in part to consumerism where people are going ew to thinking, to actually sitting and thinking about stuff and trying to solve things together and going into, you know, uh, uh, what, what does Kahneman call it? Uh, stage two thinking? No, type two thinking. Um, uh, as opposed to type one thinking, which is our instinctive knee-jerk responses. And so I think there's a little bit of, of you know, eating our broccoli together here uh, in a sense of this, this is going to be about doing some, some work to sit down and try to figure out uh, what do we think and what's going on. Uh, by the way, the, the fungi that, that destroy insects are like really gross to see, but like fascinating, really fascinating. And um, the, the there's a whole bunch of sort of uh, antagonistic mutualisms and then productive mutualisms that happen in nature. Um, uh, the one, the one, the cordyceps is like scary, and, and reading about it is really scary. But but the beneficial one, for example, at the fungus phase, um, some biologists noticed that the ants that are sitting mulching leaves at the fungus phase have a little white powder on their thorax and body. They're like, hmm, wonder what that white powder is. So they scrape it off, they go examine it. And it turns out that this is a this is a mutualistic beneficial bacterium that plays a role in keeping the fungus healthy. And it's it's you know it's it's, it's a whole piece of the ecosystem that's happening. And then the thing that I realized just yesterday after talking about the, the big fungus for a while was that the big fungus is part of the wood wide web, which is a whole series of other really interesting observations about how uh, how the world works, which is all held inside of healthy soil, Klaus. Um, and, and sort of soil, uh, you know, uh, 
there's, there's, an, there's a, a third finished essay on in one of the tabs in my browser titled Data is the New Soil, um, where you know, data is the new oil is kind of a phrase and a lot of, by which a lot of people mean data is the new precious commodity which I must hoard, refine and sell back to people. At least that's my impression. And to me, data is the new soil is the opposite of that. Data is the new soil means data is the new commons that we need to make healthy and make richer and more nutritious so that as we plant ideas and we plant communities in it, uh, things get better. So, so I think there's this, there's this admixture of, of uh, sort of actual things happening in nature that operate as metaphor as we shift them over into society and information that are really, to me, very generative, uh, very rich, very um, nutritious. And I'd like to play in that, in that area for a while. That the juicy mushroom. Juicy exactly. is kind of, juicy is a sexy word. Juicy mushroom. But uh, it's not gross. <laughs> Listen, that's true. That's true. It's a little gross because as they get old, they tend to like get leaky and but still people don't uh, think that much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The tasty mushroom makes it makes us sound like a vegan restaurant. <laughs> right. Um, any other questions, thoughts? These are these are great. Yeah, I thoughts. Had a question. I had yeah, a please, question. Stacey. So at the end of the two months, when supposedly the funding will be up, what are you hoping the next step will be? Um, one of the tasks at hand is to find other people who would like to fund this and us. Uh, possibly the Jim Rutz Family Foundation would like to re-up. I don't know. There's no, uh, there's no guarantee at all of that. This just helps us get up and get moving. Um, but I think figuring out how, what, what next to do about it is a really important question and part of the first project. And how will you measure how successful the project was? So at this point, the project just says, uh, we will stand up six episodes of Weaving the Web, and we will, for each episode, we will post openly uh, some kinds of maps. At the beginning, the default is me and the brain posted, uh, you know, to, which is what I do after, during and after every one of our calls, right? And so as links come up and as we talk about stuff during this call, I will be feeding my brain. Afterward, I'll take whatever open tabs are, are in my browser and add those to it. I will then post the whole thing uh, to the web. So, so the normal rhythm of what we do now is just part of this project. And then uh, also a part of the project is uh, setting these things up so that they look like actual podcasts with an intro and an outro, uh, figuring out who edits what and what goes where. A piece of the budget for, uh, of this project is to pay for some audio and video production uh, and things like that. Jerry, when's the first episode go up? Um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm sort of busy making plans and booking the first call. Uh, I'm thinking of setting, so um, I'm thinking of setting like Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific as a, as a regular call time, but then because a piece of the goal of, of Weaving the World is to go visit people, I think some of the episodes will just happen when those people have time. And they will be more like our pop-up calls here. But I think if, if there's a regular uh, rhythm of a, one call a week, uh, I think that would be fine. There's also the interesting question of um, if post-processing a call is important, then maybe there's like alternating shows. Maybe the one episode is some new person, new community or whatever, and we talk about stuff. And then the next episode is post-processing and whoever wants to show up uh, shows up with their own map of what they, they heard and saw during the episode and what they know about that person's or that community's thinking. Uh, you know, uh, if we do an episode on Afrofuturism, uh, then we in, in the post-processing, we're like, okay, so let's have a discussion just about what happened there. Let's not have a whole new discussion. And that, that might be an episode of the show as well. So I'm, I'm trying to think of what, what's different, uh, there, there are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of podcasts and blogs out in the world already today, um, some of which are extremely good, um, many of which are really lengthy and you can't just watch the whole things. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to then add a lot of value to this process in a way that others want to like do as well, because if what we do is, is, is easy to emulate and other people wanna start debriefing, connecting, weaving what they know into the big fungus, that is a huge win. That's like a big, that's a big deal. If, if other people start wanting to do this kind of thing as well. Um, Jer Jerry, I realize that podcasts are generally audio, but um, it might be interesting for people to watch you do the post-call processing. So, so there's a whole nomenclature thing. I'm like, so wait a minute what do you call a vlog or a video or whatever? And my best understanding as of this moment 
is that sort of technically speaking, a podcast is audio only. A video podcast is a podcast that has a video component and shows up on places like Twitch and YouTube. Um, a vlog is a video podcast-like thing, but vlogs tend to be much more informal, uh, mm -hmm. a little bit like uh, blog posts, which might be very, you know, very personal, like a diary. Uh, and that boundary, I think, is really fuzzy because Hank and John Green, uh, who are two of my heroes, are the vlog brothers, and they've been vlogging for, I don't know, 18 years or something like that. They've been doing that a very long time. And what they're doing is very clearly uh, a role model for what I'm seeing us doing as weaving the, web, the, the world. So, so the, ter um, the terminology aside, I think there's something very interesting here is that like, you know, at the end of this call, you're going to go and sit with your brain and do some stuff. You're going to do some juju stirring. Yes. That's a remarkable process. I don't know anybody who does it like you do or even understands what you're doing. And there's jewels in there to, to kind of open up the kimono. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's like, it's like the bloopers reel at the end of the movie or something like that. It's like the movie, the podcast is over. Now here's what Jerry does next before he goes off on his walk and giving visibility that, that might be fascinating. Um, agree. And, and let me come back to that in a sec, but you mentioned earlier that most podcasts are audio. Wouldn't it be interesting to see? I think our primary mode is the video podcast, which is visual, which okay. just is, it needs to be visual because of the, of the brain and stuff like that. But I suggested to Jim that there could easily be an audio podcast because we can put in the intro, Hey, the, you know, there's moments in here where we're going to do something visual. That's not going to, not going to work in the podcast, but this just opens it up to a whole bunch more people. And with, with tools like anchor.fm, um, it's relatively easy to go do something like that. And if we, can, if we can more or less automate the process of turning out an audio podcast as well, that's like fantastic. So that, that's one thought that from earlier, but then back to what you just said, Gil, um, there's a scenario in which this is a Twitch TV channel where there happen to be guests coming through, but the rest of the time we're busy weaving together and screen sharing and stuff like that. And this is actually, the post-processing is in fact a piece of the show, a little bit like live coding or whatever, where we're just kind of doing the work of feeding the fungus in, in public view. And that's interesting. Now, I'm not ready to do that, but I'm interested. Like, like if there was a three hour block every day if there was a three hour block every single day where we coded together, did this stuff together, post process together so that you know, I don't wanna have a three hour block every day where there's like six hours needed to post process what happened in a three hour block. Yeah. That's, not, that's not the goal. The goal is to do the, all of this sort of weaving as we sit together, which, which Gil, I agree is interesting. I think I, for me, I have many, many moments where I sit down and I'm like, damn it. I wish I had a time-lapse capture of the last two hours of my digging around and feeding stuff into the brain and reading articles and copying a few things out of them and taking notes. Like I've had that feeling many, many, many times. And, and I haven't ever sat down at the beginning of a period where I know I'm gonna do some, some thinking about a good article. I've never sort of sat and, and set a camera or, or uh, you know, uh, I use a Telestream, uh, uh, sorry, I use ScreenFlow from Telestream as my screen capture app. I've never, I've never sat down to, to put, turn that on at the beginning of a session like that and try something like time-lapse photography or whatever else. Um, yeah, and, and I don't wanna turn into Big Brother and the household that has video cameras on all the time either. That's like a little scary to me because um, you forget at some point that like the camera's on, like busy pick your nose and there no, you but, go. But just on your screen, just yeah. your, not your life. Well, my screen is also personal correspondence and a bunch of other stuff that shouldn't show up, you know, uh, uh, in the in the public stream. Uh, so how how to do that is is I think a question for a little bit later. But but I really like that direction a lot, and would be happy to hear other people's thoughts on it. Yeah, could I diverge on the on the picking your nose thing for a moment? Sure, diverge on picking your nose. Uh, Steve Steve um, Steve Barnett, who is brilliant cultural anthropologist, uh, uh, did high level market research for major corporations talked about planting video cameras in people's homes voluntarily, of course, so they could track their behavior around dishwashing or whatever was the object of study. Um, and they threw out all the footage that they took until people started showing up in their underwear washing the dishes. And they said, okay, now we've got data that we can use. And from there on, they gathered what they gathered because people were no longer attentive to the camera. Right, right. They, 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 all the first part was performative until people forgot the camera was there. And, and by the by, um, every Alexa device, every Google Home device, every, uh, you know, every, all these devices are now like 
we're already being piped out. Our, our private lives are, are uh, in someone's hopefully gentle and trustworthy hands, but not uh. always. But like, like cultural anthropologists of the future, if they have access to some of this data, will have more access to, if the data survives, which it's unlikely to do, they will have more access to how actual humans live day to day than anyone has ever had about any generation of, of humans. Like the idea that, that you've got a, like a, a mic or, and or a camera uh, on in people's homes all the time is like crazy, a peak. Um, we, we might have dug into it enough already, but, but um, I wanted to uh, I wanted to maybe do a little bit of market research here um, and hear from folks a little bit. What do you think when you hear podcast or video podcast or vlog, and or is it a show um, or or what? Um, so what would make you click a link that says, "Hey, there's some really." cool change the world kind of stuff here or when you're telling your friend hey um there's this cool new show i'm listening to or watching or how, just how do you how do you say that to your friend mm -hmm. um how do you you know what what words do you use um would you be interested in such a thing who do you know who would be interested in such a thing uh, klaus please yeah during my uh still employed uh period of life, you know, when I was traveling in, in LA traffic, I used to listen to, you know, podcasts all the time. I mean, I had there was, you know, certain, uh, to my big embarrassment, I was listening to Rush Limbo for some period of my life that I rather have put behind me successfully, right? But uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, this is really geared towards people who, uh, uh, who are sitting in, in traffic or who, who travel in cars. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's plenty of occasions. Uh, great question, Pete. Are there anybody else with answers for it? Like, would you be interested? What would you call it? How would you describe it to your friends? That's so funny, Gil. I, I look around and your avatar picture has your hand up. So, so pretty often I look around, I'm like, oh, Gil must have his hand. And it's like, ah, oh, shit, it's his, it's his avatar. That's not me asking for recognition. That's me casting spells. Oh, oh, you will renew the world. I like it. Um, Stacey. Yeah, so I'm focused more on the part of the show that will be um, approachable for the non-tech people. I don't even want to use the word muggles anymore because it, no, it's no more muggle. the meaning. Well, I didn't really know what it meant, but other people say it's demeaning, so... Anyway, um, it's so a lot better than sheeple. <laughs> absolutely, but yeah. Anyway, <laughs> way above sheeple. But let's just say the non-tech audience. Um, I like the idea of video um, because you feel like you know the people, and it, that makes a very big difference. From being one of those people, I can tell you, it makes a very big difference. Um, the only podcast that I ever listened to was it was uh, it was. Um, what was it called? It was like a truth and justice kind of, it was like a crowdsourcing where you actually worked as the investigator. So again, I was totally part of it. I would write in questions. We would examine the evidence. So I'm really, when it comes to dealing with whatever, we have to come up with a better name for that group of people that are right now wasting time on Facebook. I think being able to see the people and to feel like you know them. I mean, there's a reason that reality TV is so popular, even though I don't particularly care for it either. There are good parts to it or pieces to it that we would want to replicate because they're successful. Um, a couple of things just riffing on what you said, Stacey. One is it would be really, really fun to do uh, an episode or several episodes uh, pretending to be a detective show, like have a little noir intro music, um, go about this like a police procedural or, or something like that. It just would be really fun. And anybody who feels like anybody who feels like like leading us through that and framing it and, and, and produce helping produce it, please uh, like come on down. Um, and then and then my own my own approach is that the, the people who are sitting like you know Netflix or chill or or playing Nintendo all the time are in my head sort of justifiably angry and distracted citizens. They're like they're 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 most people have some are smart in some way that that we we seldom see, um, and a lot of people are doing what we think of as very time wasteful things right now. In part because 
the world seems to be cataclysmic and engaging doesn't seem to help and might as well just sit here and go back on Fortnite and play another couple rounds and my buddies are there and, and like it, it's my social circle and that's where we meet right so so for example and i don't i don't play any Fortnite, but um uh, yeah, the podcast thing is really interesting because it seems like there's a big appetite for long form audio. Um, I listen to very few podcasts. I don't have the time to sit and listen to plain audio. Uh, but I, I know a lot of people who are listening to a lot of audio. And a small side note also to what you just said, Stacey, um, I, I'm a huge fan of plain audio because um, um, video because right now i'm kind of looking at you all and at my own image on the screen and you can tell i'm not looking in the lens right which means i'm not actually making eye contact with you which the human brain is not that crazy about we really like eye contact and we and we and we have very good ability to discern when somebody's not looking at us in fact if you're standing in front of somebody you can tell if they're looking at the tip of your nose or in your eyes like like we're really really good at that and if you have only high quality audio you can whisper be closer than you can get personally like we have a, a circle of personal space and you have to stand sort of pretty far away but with high quality audio you can go you can turn the volume way down and it gets very intimate and the human voice contains a tremendous amount of emotional valence so plain audio and when i did a podcast for nine years called the yi tan technology call a couple of you might have been on some of those episodes um but but i i really like simple high quality audio but alas, this brain thing that I do is completely visual um, and trying to figure out how that works. Um, CenterCam is a podcasting service or what is CenterCam? CenterCam is a um, um, high, high definition camera on a flexible stock. You clip it to the top of your computer. Let me, let me go video. Oh, I saw an ad for it. You basically, I, I, it, it drops into the middle it, of your I got it through Indiegogo screen. or something like that. It puts, it puts a camera right in the middle of your screen. So you can be right. looking straight on camera and be looking straight on screen. And it gives the impression pretty close of that you're making direct eye contact with your audience. Interesting. I saw I saw long ago, uh, I don't know if this was proposed or ever made it to market, uh, a laptop. I think it was a laptop that had two cameras mounted at the opposite ends of the bezel. So imagine two cameras at the, at the edges out here. And it was, basic, it was basically sending out one image that it was averaging from the two so that it effectively was was catching the middle uh, of where you were viewing, which is kind of interesting. You tried to embed a camera in the center of this of the laptop screen, which is obviously technically pretty complicated. So center cam's trying to do that. The two cameras at the end would it's, that's interesting because that would let you do the in effect like a two camera shoot, like when John, you know, John Stewart pivots from looking right. at the camera turns to the other side of the desk. You could do you could sort sort of also do stereoscopic. There's a whole bunch of sort of interesting things you could do with two two cameras separated a little bit, parallax of different kinds. This is and the best then I've seen so far because I've done too many podcasts where I'm, you know, I, I've, it, when I look at, when I look at the recording later, or, you know, video cast, look at the recording later, it looks like I'm looking up all the time and not, you know, look, you know, it, 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 it yeah, it looks like I'm doing this all the time instead of right. doing this all the time. It's what I think I'm doing. So. Right. And, so, I, and, I, and I don't know if everybody knows, but when you're in gallery view, you can drag the little boxes around as long as nobody has their hand up. When, yeah. when, someone, when anyone has their hand up, you can't do this. But normally, like right now, you could drag one of our little boxes and put it. And what I try to do is whoever's speaking, I drag them up as close to the camera as possible so that it looks like I'm looking as close to the camera as I can, right? That's just a really tiny sort of thing to do. Because otherwise, you know, right now, Tony is in the lower left of my screen. And if I'm watching Tony while answering him, you can tell I ain't looking like up at the camera, right? And then- uh, Any way to defeat the hand raised blocking of that? Not as far as I know. You have a lot of hands up all the time. Uh, yeah, some some places use the hand all the time and some places not so much. Uh, a very tiny side note about parallax and all this kind of stuff back from my days as a tech analyst. Uh, one of the one of the 4,000 odd companies that pitched me had a uh, hardware uh, tool, which was basically a flat panel display. And so I'm going to describe it in a, in a probably the wrong way. But imagine that you had a flat panel display that was that consisted of a series of fiber optic cables uh, that, that were all lined up you know, behind the thing that had notches in them. And you would shine a light down each fiber optic cable that would bounce light out at you at each of the notches. And the right, you know, you you'd sort of coordinate it so that the right kind of light came through each little notch, each little notch would form a pixel. Except at the other end of the, of the fiber optic cables, you had detectors. So the entire screen was also a camera. Mm. 
The entire screen was a camera and they only had fuzzy black and white images capable. Like, like they were really early in the technology. They, they, they couldn't do like a regular camera, but they were working on it and then they disappeared. They just vanished from view and either they simply went bust or they got classified and basically taken away into, you know, Department of Defense or, or wherever else. Because what a, what a clever idea, like a, a flat panel display that you cannot tell is a camera, is, despite the fact that cameras have now gotten so teeny that they're almost imperceptible, is still a really interesting thing. And, and you could then totally get rid of the, the parallax problem because <clears throat> you could move that attention around. Anyway, back to our regular show. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, no. Oh, no, I, two things. Um, but can't you have a video, but just separate it and have an audio and a video? Because, I mean, I'm hypothesizing that this may, might just be for less tech-minded people, but somebody like me, part of what drives me to watch something is I want to see everybody's expression as they're speaking. That's really important to me. So I, I, I've i grown to really like our little faces and, and cubes, our little Brady Bunch, our, our little Brady Bunch arrangement. Um, so I'm with you. And there's a bunch of people who just really want to hear the audio because they're only going to get to listen to it in the car or whatever. And they don't want the visual distraction. And, and the reason I'm saying let's, for Weaving the World, let's stand up a video podcast and an audio podcast uh, is only because I get three files or sometimes four files from Zoom all the time, one of which is the full audio. If it shouldn't be simple enough to edit that and turn, hand it over to, to Anchor FM and hit a couple buttons and have that show up in the podcast stream as a full-fledged actual podcast. So I don't, I don't think it's a lot of extra effort for us to generate the other medium. And in so doing, let more people listen, you know, build, you know, make it available to people who have a different set of preferences about how to engage with media. I mean, there are lots of times that I'll just listen to like a Zoom call that I missed. I don't need to see everybody because I know who you are. But if I'm watching somebody like a speaker and I'm trying to evaluate, do I trust them? What do I think? Are they full of, are they full of crap? I want to see their face. And I also want to see the expression of the other expert who I might trust. And that gives me some insight into if I'm missing something or should I be looking more closely? Yeah, uh, other people's body language and expressions say a lot. When somebody, when one person's speaking and everybody else is like that, you're like, ooh, okay, that didn't go over well. <laughs> go ahead, Craig. I was just thinking that if the, uh, the verbal content, the points being made, the presentation performance is engaging enough, then I'm, the, the audio is the, the most salient uh, part of the content and the video then becomes a, a, a bonus. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind, of, I'm kind of in that school as well, Craig. Um, it's just that I use this weird brain mind mappy thing, which you lose so much when you can't see what I'm mapping. Because to me, like uh, the story told over the map is really interesting in combination, which, which, sure, also, yeah. means, which also means to me that maybe sometimes, and, and I've done this a bunch, I've done a bunch of screencasts where it's just my voiceover and on screen, what you see is either my, my brain or some images illustrating the points I'm trying to make. And I'm trying to tell a story that way. That works fine. And it's only my voice, like, uh, you know, no talking head, or I make a tiny, you know, picture in picture talking head, just me small. Um, but I'm a big fan of the power of, of plain voice. But then there's this, this, there's this big video angle to it. And, and, and I'm thinking, you know, um, in modern baseball technology, they now have, you know, if you sign up for the MLB app, you get to pick which cameras you look at because there's a whole bunch of feed, live feeds coming off the field and a good app now will let you switch, will let you be your own TV show producer so that you can go look at the dugout and you can go look at the bullpen and you can go, you know, whatever. Um, I'm just kind of making that up because I'm not a huge, uh, huge baseball fan. But, but what if as we... Um, as we feed the big fungus together, what if we can then, like if my brain were on its own display, right, in its own window, and you could tune into it or not tune into it when you wanted to and go look around and see what's, what's happening. That, that gets it, and if, and if other people using Roam were screen sharing as well. Uh, Pete experimented with ManyCam or one of the virtual cams a while ago, and he had his notes on uh, as, the, as the Zoom background behind him, which is possible. Uh, my machine starts to like huff, puff, and, and sweat really hard if I try to do that. So, not doing that until I get one of the new Macs. Um, but I'm really interested in that because 
Um, I, you know, right now I've got Monsters Inc. Uh, lobby behind me, but it would, might be really interesting to just have what's in, what's in my brain behind me. And it would be more interesting if somebody could eliminate my, my face from in front of it, if they actually wanted to go look at it. And it would be even more interesting if they could at any moment sort of wander off what I'm doing and just go be in the normal brain artifact so that they could go from, uh, you know, whatever it is I happen to be doing in the brain that they're just watching to actually zoop. Okay. I just want to go off-roading from here or other features. Uh, I want to bookmark what we're looking at right here because I want to come back to it later and remind me in two days to, to, to come visit here. That could be a feature, right? And if we had an open environment and people were thinking about these things and, and the environment allowed for some programmability like this, the things I'm talking about aren't that hard. So, so I think that as a thought experiment, but not as this first rev, like a Twitch TV show that is on a lot, uh, that has multi cameras and multi, multi people uh, participating is pretty interesting. Um, so Gil is saying, let's test feed the big fungus on various desired audiences. You mean test market the phrase or you mean the show and the other sort of stuff? The phrase. <clears throat> oh, I, I, I hear that you have a lot of juice for that name. I'm not sure it's going to work. Maybe, you know, and that's just me. I'm N equals one, just like you. So discard what I say, but it might be worth trying it out in the world and seeing how it lands. And the first metaphor I started with, you may have been in those conversations was the big quilt. Mm -hmm. because weaving and the quilt is much more, you know, th th there's actually not too much mixing of metaphors, although you probably sew a quilt, you probably don't weave a quilt, but still we're in the textile realm at least, you know. The advantage uh, of fungus there is that it's alive. And I think you want something that's alive, yes. It's alive, exactly. And, um, oh, cool. Um, and so. The fungus, uh, <sighs> picture sure. it, it does have some problems i mean you mushrooms you feed them shit and keep them in the dark you know yes perfect right <laughs> is that is that perfect <laughs> isn't that what's um, been happening to us since? perhaps the humor has to be promoted then <laughs> i really like that i really like that it's so like that's how we've been treated as citizens and it's about yeah. time we actually shine a light on that um and 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 like work on it together and you know visibly in public but you're totally right no, the self mockery is good though, Craig. And like with muggles, you know, if it, it, it's it's bad if you if you're looking down on somebody. If it's you know self acknowledgement, it can be fun. And so fungus, yes, in the dark, eating shit and so forth, but yet this vast network of life uh, out of view of all of us with biomass greater than probably anything else, right? Bigger than bigger than the bacterial biomass, which is bigger than yeah. us. So it's 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 this critically important invisible. To bring into awareness i love the analogy of the mycelium and it's alive feeding everything underlying and, everything I and so the wood wide web yeah. how fungus works all that and 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 the wood wide web is lovely because one of the uh, one of the metaphors involved in the wood wide web and uh hold on uh, uh let me just go to a thought here while i'm saying this just because um one of the lovely uh metaphors from the Wood Wide Web. So I, I created a thought called Useful Nature Metaphors. Cause I'm like, hey, leaf cutter ants, cuckoos, uh, the upward spiral, estuaries, soil fertility, horses. Uh, you know, I, I'm sort of collecting up um, <clears throat> nature metaphors I like. One of the really useful ones from the Wood Wide Web is that trees can't really metabolize minerals, fungi okay. do. So there's this exchange happening underground where fungi and trees are swapping sugars for, for other kinds of things that fungi are really good at cracking out of soil and rocks. And that, that's like wonderful. Like an exchange of nutrients uh, in the fertile, healthy soil is a fantastic metaphor for where we're trying to go. And I'm trying, I'm trying to work in that space. I'm trying to say, and, and this ties back to, uh, let me just go back. Uh, this ties back to, uh, uh, Deleuze and Guattari basically talking about rhizomes and a bunch of other stuff in the postmodern era. Uh, so, <clears throat> so here's post-structuralists talking about uh, a thousand plateaus and how we're going to have rhizomal knowledge and other kinds of things. Uh, I have that under visions that have inspired builders of global brains, this, this rhizome thing. Um, yes, like totally get it. Here's the uh, Magister Ludi, The Glass Bead Game, Doug Engelbart's Mother of All Demos, Indra's Net, which comes out of Hindu mythology, uh, the Noosphere, which is Teilhard de Chardin, 
Uh, Van Vaniver, I don't remember. I, does anybody know definitively how to pronounce his first name? Is it Vanivar or Vanivar or something different? I just thought it was Vanivar, but I don't know. I thought, but I heard somebody pronounce it Vanivar sounding like they knew what they were doing. Hmm. Anyway, so here's the noosphere, right? Which is Tile Hard de Chardin. Uh, I have all of that under global unity because I'm collecting these things um, as we step into this world, trying to make sense of the world together. Because because I think we're working in the spirit of all these visions. And some of them motivated some of us. Um, and there's, there's, you know, there's also sort of indigenous cosmologies that, that have these kinds of relationships that I think are inspiring here as well, um, that, are, that are actually like really descriptive. So if you go to the Quechua and the Aymara uh, uh, world, there's a, a, there's a whole bunch of language around relationships, reciprocity, stewardship, um, all of those kinds of things that are just baked right into the fundamental principles of how they operate as a society. Pretty cool. Right. And so, and so I think one of the stops on the weaving the world tour is probably my friend Marty Spiegelman or someone else, or Mark, if you know people we should we should talk to as well, um, to, to bring in some of that knowledge. I, I know for sure that one of the people I want to talk to is Tyson Young Caporta, who wrote Sam Talk and who's who's a, like a genius communicator. He understands how the world of business and capitalism works and understands how the world of, of Aboriginal culture works. And he's really good at drawing distinctions sort of um, between those things and connections. So I think those are really, really juicy places to go visit. Um, I know Tamsin and I have not read Teeming Gill, um, but I think it's also really uh, interesting and useful. It belongs in there, yeah. Uh, so Vanvar? Vanvar? Uh, reading that, I think it's Van Nevar. Van Nevar, oh. Uh, N-E is long. Oh, the E didn't show up because there's a question mark where the knee is. You have to, you have to read the, uh, the sentence above the dictionary. Oh, okay, sorry. And he, he insisted on being called Van because nobody could ever figure that out. Cool. It's a long knee, Van Nevar. Okay, good. Hey. <laughs> Well, uh, according to Rohit, according to Rifkin. Which is good for me. I, I, I like it a lot. Rohit usually knows what he's talking about. I like it a lot. Thank you so much. Um, so other thoughts, other thoughts about sort of test marketing the idea, what would you call it to your friends? Uh, what is this thing? And, and also, so the, there's a couple different what is this things. One of them is, is this a video podcast or a blog or a like, what do we call these objects that, that are mostly you know, like video product? Is it a webcast? Is it a web show? Don't know. So that's one question. But then the other question is, is this a knowledge gardening adventure? Is this a, like, like what is the category of thing that we're doing here? Is this a collaborative sense-making exercise? Is this a common sense discussion with memory? Is this a memory mining uh, expedition? Is this a, like, I can think of 15 things off the top of my head that, that would be interesting ways of talking about um, what this is. And I'd love to know which ones are sticky or, or exciting. Doug, you're muted. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's sensing what people are thinking about that might be new. Or old. I, I mean, the new part is the only part of what you just said that, that I was like, mm, a lot of this is that we used to know how to do this and we basically stomped on it and destroyed it. And we need to kind of recover some of that and figure, figure it out. The, the new might be in bringing it into awareness, connecting it into the rest of how the world works and what goes on. One, one of the more interesting thoughts in my brain is um, how do we blend the best of the old and the new? Well, there's I, the conversation for democracy. That's one thing. But... I'm really pointing to something else, and that is just trying to sense, uh, maybe it's back to the mushroom thing, what mushrooms are poking through the surface. That's it's nice. like I have my eyes and my ears and my fingers on all of you trying to sense, is something about to emerge here that has never emerged before? So a thinker with an idea that shows up in a book or whatever else is just like the fruiting body of a, of a mushroom popping out of the soil that's a very, I hadn't actually sort of gotten there, but, but that, that works really, really nicely. 
Um, I like that a lot. Anyone else want to riff on that? Yeah, uh, you can also uh, what what has uh, captured the imagination of of a younger generation in particular is the ability of trees to communicate with one another via a fungus underground network. So if you have an image, for example, where you take two trees and you, and, and you show underground how they're being connected through these fungi uh, uh, root systems, that, that may depict you know, what you're trying to explain. Very much so. That's, that's totally an important piece of the Wood Wide Web. Um, uh, what we're gleaning from nature about how that actually works and then metaphorically, like all the stuff that's happening. Uh, Craig, you want to jump in? I found myself wondering if, it, if this doesn't also have an aspect. Um, in that, I'm sure that people older than most of us, I mean, we've had TV since we were kids, right? And TV is a pacifier. I'm sure people were much more active. So the, there were grassroots movements. The grassroots, and, another piece yeah, of Yeah, exactly, metaphor. that came up, yeah. Um, were undoubtedly more active, large and small. There, were, there must have been a, a, a far greater proliferation and action at grassroots level among people between people before we were pacified by, by television and uh, that kind of sit and receive it in entertainment. And then with the advent of the internet, yeah, or have we lost some of our ability to actually be creative and generative? You just share it on Facebook, see what happens, you know, and move on. So perhaps this is a, a, a this uh, idea has a, an element of resurgence or regeneration of uh, human uh, organic connectivity rather than this digital that's all the, all the craze nowadays. Uh, love, love all of that and, and agree entirely. Um, and, and my intention is to try to revitalize education and journalism and science and politics and all those kinds of things by going into those territories and re-exploring them, re-examining them, and maybe you know, doing some good work. And, and if people want to come in and play, play by our side in some way, I think it gets really useful in really interesting ways. And, and, and a big piece of this is an in-your-face to the overprotection of intellectual property, which is the world that we live in today. It's mm -hmm. like we've locked away all the ideas because we feel like people need to meter them out. And what if we actually shared the ideas and tried to then, then implement them? And, and a piece of this a piece of this that's stuck in my head and I, and I want to experiment with more is that implementation piece is like, how do I take a bit of wisdom and make it easier to use? How do I leave it at hand as guidance? How do I put it in the how to video instead of in a chapter in a book? How do I uh, like, like, how do we all make everything we know that we think is smart? more useful in the world, more, more immediately applicable. Is that, is it, am I making any point here between the difference of great idea, but it's in a chapter in a book you have to buy and read versus idea made more useful in the world? Does that, does that work? Or should I explain it more? Uh, Doug, you're muted again. This might be uh, just off the point, but, um... Well, I have to come back. <laughs> I've lost the thought. That's all right. Yeah, um, unmute yourself when you when you've got it back. Um, so, anybody else is the point I'm trying to make clear or muddled? Like, and I use the example of the pattern language pattern one two four all, which is like a smart pattern. And if you're a facilitator, you know about it and you know how to implement it. But if you're not a facilitator, you won't know of its existence and you won't be able to use it. But it might improve your meetings. So how do we actually build something that lets you click a couple buttons and then use this more interesting, sophisticated process that's, that's good for group process? Go ahead, Doug. Okay. Uh, it seems to me that when society is coming together and there's a new development that's positive, linking any two things is a contribution. When things are falling apart 
any linking that you make is likely to also fall apart. So it's demotivating to make the links. And I think we're in a time when we're still in a process of decay of the old culture. And it makes it very hard to bring things together because we have the sense that they're gonna be pulled apart by, by circumstances. Um, yes, and I think an important piece of this, and, and uh, Pete and I and a couple other OGMers were on a call a couple of days ago with the Internet Archive about the, uh, and I learned a new word, fixity, uh, which is sort of like, how permanent is anything? And as we move into distributed stores like IPFS, uh, the interplanetary file system, like how do you know that something's actually even gonna be there later? Or, the, or do the links all fall apart? Do we just get long-term link rot and all this just goes away? And so I think that that's an interesting piece of the question. And, and I think collaborating with the Internet Archive, which we might end up doing more of, uh, might be one really good way to add years to the lifespan or usable lifespan of what we're doing. Because there's, there's a scenario in which anthropologists 300 years from now don't know crap about what happened during this time, despite all the cameras and microphones we had in our homes, because all this data just got ruined through an EMP or through bad data migration or through whatever. There's a world in which anthropologists have nothing to dig on. There's another world in which there are no anthropologists because we wiped ourselves out, but that, we don't want to talk about that one. But, 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 but this, could, this could be the dark hole of data, or it could be the, the mother load of diamonds, uh, depending on how we handle this and what we do. Go ahead, Doug. Well, uh, I do think it's important to sense what's the this nature of the time in which we're trying to act. Uh, it conditions what we do and whether it's going to be successful or not. Agreed. And the times are different depending what country you're in, depending where you are in society. Like the times are like, they're not uniform, right? So if we, were, if we were trying to do this in China right now, I'd be like, hey, let's just put on a cooking show. Mm -hmm. That I, I would totally not be trying any of this shit in China. Mm -hmm. Like it wouldn't work. Uh, we, would be, we would be shut down quickly. Uh, Gil, go ahead. Um, oh, <clears throat> to, to, to Doug's comment, what makes this an interesting and challenging time is that both of those processes are happening at the same time new things are being born, things are falling apart. So you can't play one game. You have to play both games and probably a third one, which I guess is what we're trying to do here. Yep. Yep. And we're trying to invite in other people who have other ideas about how to go about doing this. Um, and then, then we're trying to figure out how to have our perspective and thoughts and resources meet theirs in fruitful ways. Could I just add one thing about the, the living between worlds? I came across a quote from Antonio Gramsci, the Italian revolutionary, what, 100 years or so ago? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and Gramsci said the old world, approximately, the old world was dying uh, and the new one is struggling to be, to be born uh, in between is the time of monsters. And I listen to monsters in the dual sense of both, you know, evil, destructive, terrifying creatures, but also, you know, mysterious primal forces that we don't grasp. I will point to my background here for just a second and say that not all monsters are bad. Yeah. You know, they get written into history as the bad guys, but, yeah. but what, if, what if we could enjoy the fungi and the monsters mm -hmm. uh, and kind of tame them and, and enter a dance somehow? And, and, and I think the Gromsky quote is like right on. I think that there's this moment of punctuated equilibrium that's chaotic. Um, but, but, you know, the point of Monsters, Inc. is that all these monsters that are giving children nightmares can actually like shift around and, and do good in the world. Other thoughts? Um, it seems my check-in took like the whole first hour. So I'd love to go around and, and uh, do some check-ins if we wanna hang out for the, the next 30 minutes. Uh, I'd love to do that, but this has been totally generative and fun uh, and useful. So I, I really, I really thank you. Um, so if you want to experiment with this on your friends, like, you know, uh, try out some of the phrases or ask them, hey, what do you call like a show? What do you call one of these modern over the, you know, over the top shows that like over the top is a, is a TV industry term because it means you're bypassing regular 
uh, TV networks and the cable TV system. So OTT is kind of its own little acronym, but only for only for execs in that business or people in that business. Uh, I don't think that, and I don't, I don't think it's a very useful metaphor. Uh, but you know, we're in a world where media is being deconstructed and reconstructed, and it's breaking up and, and fanning out again. Um, and every different every form of medium is 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 having this happen. You know, if you like watching movies, for example, and TV shows, you are currently trying to figure out exactly how many of these networks are you going to subscribe to separately now? Right? It's kind of nuts. So, um, okay, so, so let's, um, we can leave that behind. Uh, and uh, Doug, do you wanna check in? Maybe we go uh, Doug, Craig, Stacy. Well, I don't know if I have much, of coherence for a check-in, but I think that, uh, you know, as a species, we have really goofed up in our choice of technologies and they're killing us. Mm -hmm. And there's a big story to tell there, but it's in the context of uh, the situation is so dire that it's hard to know exactly how to proceed. So when I come to a conversation like this, I'm looking for clues as to how to proceed uh, and um, there's some, but it's, it's a little thin. Um, agreed. And and I think the I think the best spirit in which to proceed is one of fun and humor, because otherwise the situation is so goddamn dire that we're just all going to get depressed and need to find counselors and tap out on our energy to do this. So, so Stacy, the, the 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 focus you have on on games and play and and that kind of thing, I like I like a lot. And I think that that being sort of tongue in cheek about this is good. But I also, uh, Doug, when I talk about making things practical and usable, I'm I'm talking a lot about what you what you just said. It's like, okay, so what what do we do next? Um, and where can I put in some effort myself? And how does that work? And we don't we don't. We don't have that infrastructure and we don't we're not making those points at, at this point so we have a thin we have a thin conversation where we're waving our hands a lot but it would be really nice if it were uh, better instrumented toward usefulness so I'm, I'm disagreeing with the thing about uh jokes and humor now you started the session today with let's be happy yeah. and i i actually would prefer i think to be in a conversation now with okay, it's pretty clear we're all gonna die. It just isn't quite clear yet how. Uh, and what do we do with that? That's a conversation that I'd like to have. You know, Sogyal Rinpoche in his book, The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying said that there are only two things that we know for certain in this world. And he's sort of paraphrasing you there. He said, one is that we will die. And the other is that we don't know when. So you're speaking about it in the, in the midst of this crisis, but that's also the human condition. Uh, so I think we can, you know, I think it's possible to face that with grimness uh, and with grief uh, and with love and with humor. All of them, not leaving out any of it, but you know, maybe that's just the way that I cope with this. Um, and, and I'm also not suggesting we turn this into a sitcom or trivialize the situation. I'm just saying that um, learning, working, and playing can be combined in a really fruitful way. And when we separate them and try to like silo them, it doesn't really help humans. And that this can be a sort of a journey that where we're doing all, all those things and taking things very seriously, but, but I fear being serious all the time because these are serious issues and you need to be serious about the serious issues. That's, so uh, I don't know. Uh, I, think the, I think the way we move forward together is by like enjoying being with one another. So uh, Doug, well, like I, I'm, I'm hearing the, the moment is calling for a lot more seriousness than anybody's giving it, right? And uh, somebody, who was it? Was it Stacy? Somebody was just telling me that Greta Thunberg's last speech uh, was like, uh, she started quoting all the buzz phrases, you know, the net zero, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And she started going through all the different sort of buzz phrases that groups of reasonably good intent are coming up with to say, this is our, this is what we're doing to work on climate change. And, and she was basically dismissing all of them. I think I haven't heard her talk, 
um, and probably is right. Like, like this isn't going to get us there. She wasn't, she wasn't dismissing the impulses. She was dismissing the talk in the face of the numbers going in the wrong direction. Right. Like, like uh, there's not. A single, there's only one country in the world that's on track for their climate commitments. It's the, it's the Gambia, who most people have never even heard of. There are hardly any companies that are on track. So I think that's her point: is that you know, talk without action is bullshit. She's not saying that talk is. I don't think she's saying that talk is irrelevant. Talk, yeah. is, way, talk is one of the ways you get to action. Right. Um, right. Talk is a substitute for action. You know. But as long as it's just talk, it's not interesting. And one of the things I think that characterizes right now is that there's no plan for what action could actually look like. What action by who? Uh, how do you stop fossil fuels, stop the oil companies from selling this stuff? Well, there's no plan for how to do that. So, so you get projects uh, like, like yeah. let's cut, cut everything by uh, the year 2035, but there's no ideas to what to do tomorrow or the rest of this year. Doug, Doug with respect, I strongly disagree. There are lots of plans. I built one of them. Uh, I know friends of mine who built others of them at city level and corporate level and policy level. They're not being implemented. Being okay, implemented. that's what I mean by action. I don't they're, mean they're there's not, lots of policy, but no action. Well, there's lots of action, but there's also lots of barriers. And you know, you've got you've got the political control the fossil fuel industry has in this country, which means you can't pass legislation that you need to pass to do stuff. So you need to have political action. Um, at set, you know, we could this this is this is a whole call in itself. Uh, so I would not say there's no action. I say the action is failing. Um, the action's not serious enough. It's not taking on core issues enough. Um, it's not taking on structural issues enough. But you had you know. Yeah, so I, I, I'm agreeing and disagreeing with you. I think, it's, I think it's not helpful to say there's no action, but the action is either not effective enough, not being implemented enough, or not aimed at the critical levers. There's, la there's, there's missing pieces in it. And back to Greta, you know, um, on any objective measure, we're failing and failing drastically and are headed for a deep lot of trouble. There's a world of hurt coming for lots and lots of people, and we got a taste of it this past year through extreme climate events and other sort and forest fires and a bunch of other stuff. And this is just going this is just going to get amplified. It's just starting. Yeah, it's just starting. And you know, uh, little towns in Germany where 400-year-old homes were washed down river because nobody expected a flash flood there. And oh, look, that, you know, pros prosperous little towns in the middle of Germany places that have had three 500 year floods in five years well it's it's pete Buttigieg's magical answer uh yeah. to the question about climate change he's like i'm i'm the mayor of a small town in indiana um in, the, in i've only been mayor for like six years in my tenure we've had two 500 year floods i'm either the unluckiest mayor in the world or there's something really different going on and i'm like that was just crystalline so could i check in off of that please um, I've, I've, I've said this before, but this sort of raised it in a new frame for me. I am, um, um, I, I'm getting more requests to speak lately and they are ranging from um, a, 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 a keynote to a bunch of businesses in Moscow next month who are just sort of stepping into the whole sustainability game. And they're wondering what, do, what do, how do we think about this and what do we do? Um, and a workshop at Sustainable Brands next month, which is um, you know, companies that have been in the game for a long time. And what we're doing there is kind of a sustainability smackdown. It's like you know, seasoned professional saying, hello folks and potential clients, everything you're doing is bullshit. I'm sort of hovering between them. I'm getting requests from both ends, folks who are just realizing there's something going on and I need to deal with this. And folks who are hard at work sometimes um, you know, just trying to get by and look good enough and sometimes really trying to do something and are woefully inadequate. So I'm trying to speak into those two realms. Doug, this is a version of what you and I just talked about. And it's very challenging to figure out, um, I can stand here and just sort of see what shows up or I can go out and say, here's what I want to offer to particular potential audiences and clientele. And I'm challenged trying to figure out how to stand in that, in the dichotomy of the, of the between worlds of the you know, old world dying, new world being born, living with monsters, living with massively different listening, uh, with you know, big evil forces arrayed against us and massive ignorance arrayed against us. So I'm sort of living there 
Mm -hmm. And at a very practical, <laughs> practical level, I, last night before I went to bed, I looked at the list that I built of the books that I want to write. And, um, you know, I've got, I, I got like 15 books in mind, but I've got probably, you know, what, five to 15 working years left in me. So I get to, I, I have to choose, you know, like what are the two or three or four that I'm going to write over the next decade or two and which one I'm gonna, I'm, I'm going to do now. And so I'm in a bit of overwhelm. Uh, kind of in a good way. It's like, it's an, op it's an opportunity filled overwhelm, but pretty confusing to know where the most useful steps to make that will both have an impact in the world and provide some sort of sustaining revenue flow to Jane and me. So that's my checkup. So two things that what you just said triggered for me. One of them is, I'm, it's fascinating at the end here that what you're thinking about is books, that the unit of measure for getting your wisdom in the world is the book. Can I, I'll, I'll put books in quotes, but keep going. Okay. And I'm really, 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 really interested in deconstructing that thought so that what you leave in the world are artifacts that are more useful than books are. That's what I mean. Thank you. That could be woven together and press a button and they could be extruded mm -hmm. as a book. And you could be like, hey, look, there's a label on this. We made pretty cover art and it's a book. But actually the thing online is mm -hmm. alive and connected and will tell you where to go and and put your life energy and all of that. So, mm -hmm. so that the book is just a, a souvenir artifact mm -hmm. out of your thinking. So, yep. so that seems a lot juicier to me than, than I, if I write three books, you know, by the time I die, I will love feel it. happy. I love right? it. I love it. And I'm, I've got two requests. One is I, I would request a longer conversation with you about this <clears throat> to kind of think together because it's similar to what you're doing in, in, a, in a different way. And second, uh, I, I request of all of you, um, I, I, I think I need a producer partner person who can help me do that, who is you know, facile with the technology, uh, has a grasp of, of multi-dimensional multi multimedia strategies and can work with me to build something. Not work for me, not, not, I, don't want, I don't want like a tech working for me to do it, I want a partner to help create something like that together. So if people have ideas or ways to point me, I would love that. Thank you. So maybe we're describing a new job category in the universe because April just wrote her book, Flux. She worked with a really, really good book editor, Steve mm -hmm. Piersanti at Barrett Kaler. He was mm -hmm. fantastic. And He's his legendary. And his interactions with her, I watched as, as like the book outline, just the, the book proposal got better, the book outline got better. And by the time they were like, okay, and let's let's sign a little contract and, and you write a book with us by the time they got there she just had to sit down and write what was what was in the outline because it was his the interactions were so fruitful mm -hmm. i is he think retiring? pardon is he retired he's he's semi-retired he takes two or three books a year she was one of them okay. um it, it just worked out really beautifully um i think what we're talking about is the idea doula of the next century yeah. I, think there's a, I think there's a job category that doesn't exist yet yeah. of stewards of ideas who curate them into the shared medium that we're trying to stand up here, whatever the hell it winds up being called. The yeah. big, it won't be called the big fungus. I have a long track record of snuffling in the right areas and not picking the right name, mm -hmm. right? I wrote an issue of, of Esther's newsletter called What's a Zine? Borrowing the word zine from small circulation pubs. What I described in the issue was what turns out to be a weblog. And then Pete, Kim, Pete Mirholz, a different Pete, uh, names it, hey, it's a wee blog. Let's call it a weblog. And that sticks. Awesome. But, but, but it was it's roughly the same thing. Um, so I think we're going to have people helping other people not just birth the idea, but, pu but put the idea in the world in a useful, practical, woven way. Yep, yep. And that is a different, and it requires hyper literacy, hyper textual literacy. It yeah. requires a bunch of skills that we that are right now kind of in different silos. And I think a piece of this voyage is to figure out what is that role, and to get people in that role, and start getting them connected to people like you and, yeah. and other people in the world who want to get ideas out of their heads into mm -hmm. books. So I'm I'm looking for either somebody who does that already, or somebody who wants to become that person. Yes, bingo. You to create that, and with your permission, Jerry, I'm going to grab uh, out of the out of the recording. I'm going to grab. I'm going to transcribe this section and turn that into a request and post that live in the world. If that's okay with you, I, I would be thrilled. That sounds wonderful. I yeah, love that. I'll and loop, then I'll loop you in. And then one more thing I wanted to add before I turn the floor over to Pete, which is, um, uh, and this goes to your working with people like old hands at sustainability, trying to figure out what to do and say hi to Koan uh, for me, please. Yeah. When you go to SB, um, and then the newbies that are Don't just like, the virtual. how do we do this? 
Yeah. Um, so maybe you're the bearer of, of a bearer of the mother of the the scoby of the the starter, right? And yeah. and what's happening with the experienced hands is they're busy like tending the starter and make refining refining the yeasts, purifying it, trying to figure out how do we go about doing this, critiquing what's happened, uh, and and with luck with luck coming up with new hybrid versions and better, better starter. And then what you're doing when you're traveling back and talking to the newbies is you're taking some of that starter because you're at the leading edge of that and taking it back to the new communities and dropping that starter in there. And if you can, if you can modify your approach with the newbies and think of it as starter, like how do I get them moving on these ideas in a way that's contagious, infectious, nutritive, uh, uh, you know, will sort of grow through the enterprise and not kill them like cordyceps, but rather feed them like the fungus in the in the ant hill, um, then they're on their way and they can start joining us on the journey to fix all this shit because the shit needs fixing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thanks. So you're kind of a butterfly or a connector or a bridge or a bearer. There's this really interesting uh, book. Um, well, you know, I've always thought of I've always thought of pollinator as a kind of you know identifying reference for myself, butterfly or, or, or bumblebee or so forth. But the notion of the mother, the wart, the the starter yeast is a very rich and interesting way to go with that story. Thank you. Um, there's a really really interesting. Oh, good. Uh, let me screen share it. There's a really interesting book called A Story Waiting to Pierce You: Mongolia, Tibet, and the Destiny of the Western World, <clears throat> um, by Peter Kingsley. And he talks about a character called Aberis Skywalker, also known as Aberis the Hyperborean. He has a Wikipedia page. Um, he talks about how Greek myths have Eastern sources and how Hyperborea means uh, the land beyond the North Wind and how Aberis Skywalker travels the world with an arrow which he brings to Pythagoras and how Greek wisdom is seeded by the Mongolians and, and traditions that come out of the steppe. And I'm like, I'm like, I, I, holy crap. And, um, and it may or may not be true. I don't know. I do know that I've been on the steppe in Mongolia. And at one moment I was standing in front of a stupa, which was basically a big pile of rocks with, with flags all around it and a bunch of little uh, spinning uh, prayer wheels and other kinds of things sort of just left by, by passersby. And I felt like I was standing at the umbilicus of the world. Mm. I absolutely had this feeling like, holy crap, there's nobody, there was nobody else around. I was like, it's just us, just April and me. And I'm like, I'm standing on the umbilicus of the world somehow. I just had that, that total instinct. Anyway, um, maybe you're a, a version of a Barris bringing, bearing the gold arrow. Uh, and that, that's a different sort of metaphor for the starter or whatever. But I think it's an, a really important mission. Uh, sorry for way too long a preamble, Pete, but the floor is yours. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Gil. Um, uh, uh real quick gil i i have a a technical solution for publishing um interactive stuff and also extruding books and pdfs and things like that <clears throat> um it's around massive wiki and i'm helping other people do that okay. um uh it's it's not the only way to do it but it's one one way to do it um it's actually there's a an interesting thing right now in discussion with one of those folks who wants to publish a big thing, a uh, big interactive thing. Um, we're looking at the difference between FedWiki and, and MassiveWiki. Um, FedWiki is really good at weaving little, little chunks of information together among multiple people. MassiveWiki, I hope, is going to be good at making information kind of replicate a lot. Um, and uh, it, it's, I, I don't, I think it's, it's kind of designed to make information replicate a lot more than even stay coherent necessarily. But uh, I think that's an important thing um, uh, because you, you massive wikis kind of replicate and then everybody tweaks them um, and they don't necessarily connect, uh, you know, um, to their source really well. They do connect internally um, really well. They have a good sense of history. Anyway, a longer story than I wanted to tell. Um, I wanted, Gil, I wanted to, to talk about your conundrum and your um, dilemma and, and uncomfortableness or, or comfort um, facing, um, you know, what it's do more, I do? It's more unsettled than uncomfortable, Pete. Unsettled is, is a good way to say it. The, uh, 
a, a heuristic I've kind of been working on is, first of all, um, take care of yourself, um, make sure that your efforts um, to inform and help the rest of the world are sustainable over the long term, um, and you and your, you know, your, your people. Um, but then the, the thing that frustrates me is seeing people attack systems at the wrong level. Yeah. And for me, the, the big thing is that I, and I've kind of talked through this before, but for me, the thing is that the systems that we have are no longer human scale, the, the ones that are causing the big problems. And so people get really tempted because they're people, they say, I'm going to change the minds of, you know, the leader of the world, or I'm going to change the minds of a thousand leaders of the world, or I'm going to change the mind of millions or billions of people in the world. And the, the problem with that is that the hyperscale social structures that we have aren't people. So hypercapitalism is not a person. It's not a group of people. It's a structural thing that is that that uh, we are uh, symbiotic with, um, but it it runs with its own um, own psychology and sociology and things like that. That is not human. Um, so. Uh, every time I see somebody going, you know, I'm going to change, I'm, I'm going to use politics to change a bunch of people mind, people's minds, or I'm going to use politics to change the way that we evaluate things. It's kind of like politics is kind of like the, the really low level of where you need to be working. Um, and, and where we have the most leverage is figuring out how to um, modify the way those hyperscale social structures compete with one another and win against one another, beat each other up. Um, so, so my heuristic is look for look for the leverage point and look at bigger and bigger social structure scale, not at you know you have to try to like leverage yourself out of human scale inter interventions into these massive hyper hyper scale social structures um, I, I may be missing some thank you but i may be missing something because i'm hearing a contradiction between uh um, inappropriately intervening at big scale but working toward big scale i think that's um understanding something you're saying Say that again. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you say that we often attack systems at the wrong level, like I'm going to transform global capitalism. But you also talked about, about um, being able to build, what was your word, social scale. B build social, social structures. Scale. Social structures, uh, hyper social structures. So the, the bad guys in, in this cosmology, um, they're, they're not bad guys. They're monsters um, in, in both the good and bad senses of the Love term. Keep going. Um, so, uh, so, you know, we invented multinational corporations in the, you know, 1500s or 1600s or something like that. Okay. When we invented multinational corporations, they seemed like they had a, 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 a board of directors and they seemed like they had investors and things like that. Um, over the course of the last three or 400 years, they've kind of gotten out of control. And the, the rules of the game that Google and Apple and Facebook um, and Amazon have to play are the rules of competing with other hyperscale social structures. Um, it doesn't have a lot to do with, I, you know, in, so in my cosmology, um, uh, even a human at the top, even that, so another thing I think of is sandworms. Um, these things are like big sandworms and you have the tiny little um, person on top of it riding a sandworm. Yeah, it. So, so Jeff Bezos or, um, or Rupert Murdoch uh, is a human um, and they are doing a, a good or bad job of riding a sandworm. But 
the problem is that we live in a world of massive monsters, these hyperscale social structures. Um, if it wasn't Rupert Murdoch driving his sandworm, um, the hyperscale social structures and the way that we've evolved to these massive things, which we coexist with, but we have a hard time seeing, I think, um, we would have, it, it would have been somebody else in the driver's seat. We didn't have to have Rupert Murdoch driving his somewhere to cause the, the chaos that Rupert Murdoch has. It's the structures around it that allowed one of those monsters to go crazy and just beat up um, nations around the world. And so, you know, we, it's, it's really hard, I think, it's hard for me, it's really hard for people to go, it's not so much Rupert Murdoch being a bad driver or being a nasty son of a bitch. Um, it's really the fact that we've got this system of these massive things that have a huge amount of investment and a huge amount of power driving around rampaging. So we've got these golems except they're not just golem size they're like you know like a thousand x golem size and they're they go around smashing things and they don't we we think that rupert murdoch hates us personally i you know i if i'm thinking about rupert murdoch i'm going damn that guy must hate me because he has fucked up my nation a lot why does he do that you know it's it's missing the point when you think of it that way rupert murdoch is just being an idiot he's a idiot driver on top of a big monster um and if it wasn't the monster that developed under him it would have been the monster that developed under some other asshole and you know it's and and so why why how how can we why why did we get these things so big why do we let them get so big how did they get so big without us in control what are we going to do about the fact that these huge monstrous things rampage around well, this, 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 let me bring you back down to the sand, Pete, because this begs the question of how do we become worm riders, um, you know, which happens in a couple of different ways. One is, you know, how do you transform this big thousand X golem system? What, what is it that changes those things at that scale? And the other is that in the midst of this, you have people like, you know, um, Ray Anderson from Interface and Paul Pullman from Unilever, who's got a book coming out next month, who emerge out of that monstrosity. Yeah. Uh, and are beacons of something else and you know and sometimes can actually do shit before they get fired by their boards um, um, uh, in in some ways the most useful work that i do is one-on-one with people you know as like executive coach for somebody inside a company uh, or or what i've occasionally managed to pull off um, is an offer that I call thinking partner. I say, look, you know about thought leaders, forget that. How about a thinking partner? Because you probably never get to think in your job. You know, you certainly can't think with your boss in the same way you can with somebody independent and outside. You can't think with your reports the same way. Um, when, I was, when I was in exec at Palo Alto, one, uh, commiserating with one of the other department heads who said, you know, I barely, if I, can, if I can have an hour a week to think about what I'm doing, I'm really, really lucky. I'm mostly just racing to do all the stuff that's in front of me. And so um, for me, that, that, that's a juicy opportunity that I'm trying to cultivate is to get a couple of relationships like that, completely off the record, frank, no bullshit, tough love. Let's imagine, what do you want for yourself, your family, your world, your company, whatever it is. So, um, and back to Jerry, your point, I, I'm, I'm, I come out of an era where a book seems like a doorway into that. A, a buddy of mine I just talked with yesterday, he's been named uh, head of sustainability for one of the largest accounting firms in the world. And apparently just, it came pretty much out of his book. Somebody got his book and said, let's hire this guy because we like the voice in that book. Now, it doesn't have to be a book. It could be any number of media, but it's some kind of provocative messaging, you know, the, the war that, let something grow that lets an invitation happen. Jerry. So you're already a published author. So it's not like you don't have a book. The problem right. is that books have half-lives and they basically age out of the public attention. And they, right? have, de- and they have development yeah. lives that are too slow for me because I don't want to I don't want to write something now that hits the streets in two years. Bingo. Um, yeah. and, but also the book is the modern calling card. 
Yes. So, so the thing you want to do is get a book, write an HBR article, and then go, go run your business behind those things. Cause those are in fact, <clears throat> the kinds of things that get you pulled into different sort of settings where you, where presumably you'd like to be spending your life energy. Yeah. Um, part of what I said earlier is that do something really interesting and meaningful that as a byproduct, you can extrude as a, as a souvenir time, time shot, uh, snapshot of a moment in time called a book. Yeah. And so I'm not saying you wouldn't make a book in that process, yeah. but, but rather that, and then the book is, is your calling card, but rather that, that the artifact the book is coming from is openly available and is thought about differently than normally we think about books, about how books yep. work in the world. Yep. Because books are really, really clumsy ob objects in this world. We, we have not, we have done a terrible, miserable job of making the knowledge that's in books actually useful. Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody. I know we're at time. This is very juicy and very helpful. And I really, really appreciate it and would love to follow up with any of you who would like to. And I renew my request. Um, if you know anybody who could partner with me on something like this or even on a piece of it, uh, I'm really ready for that. So <clears throat> I'd love to. I'd love to. Dr. Santi. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd love to be in the conversation. But also I'm thinking that an important piece of weaving the world and the big fungus moving forward is trying to figure out what that role is, making room for that role, yeah. shining a, a, a spotlight or at least a, a candle on that role and seeing who shows up and would like to try to be that role. Because I, I, I know that there's a piece of that role that I can actually do. And then there's a bunch of pieces of that role that I am terrible at and have no business trying to do. Um, but, but, but I'm very interested in sort of what are the hybrid pieces of that role and, and can we get a bunch, a bunch of people doing this? And can this be like, it would be really fun if there was a, a, vol a VISTA, volunteers in service you know, uh, to the world where people who did this could go out, high schoolers could join this and figure out how to do it and go do it the, around the world, helping it'd us. It would be really fun, if, really fun if OGM could provide the platform that you were just suggesting that I create. That, you know, that tool set, that set of capabilities of multidimensional quick turnaround, dropout artifacts along the way, that could be an OGM service. For so us. if you look in the, in the chat, I mentioned a massive tile, which I then, I then explained a little bit later, but maybe there's a project to create something that's better than Gitbook, which is like, you know, the, 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 I don't think Gitbook is state of the art anymore, but, you know, using GitHub to publish an open book is an interesting, interesting idea. Uh, what, what's better than that? Right. And maybe there's, there's a, if we can break that down into some steps, uh, maybe there's an interesting way to get there. Yep. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is awesome. Any, anyone want to put a bow on today's conversation? I just want to say this was a great conversation. I'm really looking forward to the continuing conversation with Bentley and hopefully Michael will show up because I want to be able to see how this project is going to influence or impact the conversations about the commons that we've been having. And I'm most excited about the post-production piece of this project. Cool. Um, and just so everybody knows, we're repurposing the Wednesday morning calls, which have been the generative commons calls, and we're turning those into uh, weaving the web operations calls to sort of stand this thing up. Uh, I'm not sure whether I should keep the 7 a.m. slot or shift it to 8. Um, and I'm playing with uh, 9 a.m. Wednesdays uh, for the show, except I'm realizing, Pete, that steps on your massive wiki calls, I think. Wednesday, yeah. Yeah. So hey, let, how let many me figure that out. How many do you do? Pardon? I was ask you. week are you on these calls? I think each of us is in a, in a mess of them. I, I think Pete is booked wall to wall. I don't know. <laughs> so... Uh, so I let's, wanted let's, to ask you. I wanted to ask you if you ever thought about putting them to an e some of them to an evening hour. The ones you know, since we talk about like the socializing component, I was just curious because I know some people actually work and can't make these calls. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, like a five p.m. slot would be good for East and West Coast. It's terrible for Europe because uh, Europe would be asleep. Bad for Asia. Uh, but 5 p.m. I think is is reasonably good for Asia. 7 oh, a.m. for me. So yeah. Do you get up early? I'm up at seven every day. Oh, good. Okay. If there are people in Hong Kong or Australia, it's even uh, 
It's even yeah, better. It's, it's really nice. It's for, us, for them, yeah. Okay. So, so the UK, it's the middle of the night, unfortunately. We could totally do 5 p.m., for example. That's 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 very doable. Yeah. I was just wondering how other people felt about that. Anybody? I, I think you, I've, uh, Mike, I have a concern about um, ge geography. Um, so there's a weekly, weekly Wednesday call at 9 a.m. and a weekly Wednesday call at 5.30 p.m. Pacific. Um, and so one of them works well for US, EU, and one of them works uh, well for uh, Asia, um, Australia. So you're doing both of those on Wednesdays? Uh, it's Wednesday for Wendy in, um, in Australia, and it's Tuesday for me. And then it's, so it's Tuesday at 5.30 Pacific time. Yeah, which is okay. her Wednesday. And then okay. we have one on Wednesday, which is her Thursday, but it's in the middle of the night. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, what, um, what Fernando does for his calls, he has, on the days that he has sessions, it's, uh, there's an 8 a.m. two-hour session and then a 3 p.m. two-hour session. Essentially the same core content, obviously the discussion goes in different ways, but that's right. to accommodate a global audience. Cool. Um, okay, let's, let's do on this. I, I, I'm totally open to moving things around and uh, making it work for more time zones and all of that kind of thing. So thank you very much. This has been like super productive. Doug, thumbs up is for what? <laughs> are, you, are you unmuting, Doug? Uh, Gil was just asking, you just gave the thumbs up and he was, Gil was trying to figure out for which thing. <laughs> hey, in general, <laughs> you're muted, Doug. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, uh, any time we decide that we're not doing now is gonna cause some conflicts, but that's okay. Cool. We'll work it out. We'll Thank work you. it out. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye, all. That was a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you.